Hello everyone, good morning. Thank you for coming on a Sunday morning. My name is Ashrish and I am the creator of India and Pixels, a YouTube channel where we talk about data visualization, uh, languages of India, pop culture and a platform where anyone can create infographics out of public data. I want to start by telling you about my journey of how I started telling stories. As a kid, you give me one page of text to read and I would sleep instantly. But if you give me a ton of comics, I would be hooked on and I would finish it. And uh, you know, that is how journey of my visual thinking process started with comics and storytellings and coffee table books. Around that time, this was 2017-18, the Facebook was going through the Cambridge Analytica data scandal thing. And that made me think, here is a multi-billionaire organization profiting off my data. Why can't I do the same thing on my own? Can I hack my own data sets and try to understand about my own identity? Where do I belong to in the digital sphere of connected dots and social media? So what I decided was to do a data exploratory project. I, I wrote a code which would scrape all my friends list on Facebook and it would extract all of their friends and document it into a clear organized data set. So I had individual friends and I had list of their own friends. From this I implemented an algorithm that would convert this into edges and nodes on a tree network. Some techies here would know how a graph network looks like. So those are the nodes and the edges. And then I implemented a force clustering algorithm where what would essentially happen is like every dot would be represented by a friend and the size of this circle would be how many conversations I have had with them, like the messages. So the darker and the larger the circle, the more closer that friend is to me. And then I ran a simulation. The simulation was the people who are friends with each other, they would attract, and the people who are not friends with each other would sort of repel uh, each other. And the, this is how the sort of initial setting looked like. Every dot was like a person here, as you could probably see. You know, that's Pranay, that's my very good friend Ankita over there. And finally, when I ran the simulation, I got something like this. That was a huge, that all of these are dots, all of these are people. And these lines are basically friendship networks. So they are friends with each other, they would sort of be clustered together. And here I could see in one go, where do I lie in the digital ecosystem. This was this whole blog of IIT Kharagpur, all my friends from IIT Kharagpur. This was a small blog of my media lab friends. This was my school, my relatives. And in one go, I could paint my life without instructing the data model in any way and get like a representation of how my life looks like. I, I, I got like starting hints of the fact that you could use these methods to build dashboards to understand your own life in an interesting manner. Following that year, uh, on 8th September 2018, India got rid of the colonial era law, section 377. I was at the Supreme Court as a petitioner to strike down this law. And I wanted to visualize what, how exactly did this country really think about the repelling of this law. And I decided to do a project called 13 into 29, which nerdily adds up to 377. So 13 different fields of India, 29, influential people from each field. I created a dashboard where I visualized each of these 13 fields as networks of people. Each line over here represents like whether they follow each other on Twitter or not. And I wanted to verify, are people who think alike, do they respond in a similar manner if they follow each other on Twitter or not? And you had like these 13 different disciplines, the government, the opposition, states, faith, journalism, law, sports, Bollywood music creativity and I visualized this in a way where uh, there was a flower base and for each positive tweet that was uh, about this law there would be a flower put there and finally you had something like this. These are the different fields and the number of flowers represents how excited or enthusiastic people were related to that field. Projects like this make me believe that Data analysis is not just a thing that is limited to quantitative assessment. It can be literally a tool for you to understand society, understand your life, and tell stories which 
are grounded in truth and are told in a very interesting manner. The issue, however, is when you start to use data, all you get is things like this. Bunch of PDF with like lots of numbers and you don't have any idea of where to look at, what patterns are there, unless you obviously analyze and visualize them. For example, let's do a quick test. Here are a bunch of numbers. Can someone shout at me which is the largest number here? Come on, 10 seconds. I say one or two. All right, let's answer, ask a different question to ask. Let's say I divide it in the four grids. Which grid here, one, two, three, four, has the highest sum total? Three. This one? Yes. So I think it still took like some wrong guesses and some time for you to still answer it. What happens if I just colorize it? I don't think at this point you even have to think. Just by looking at it, it almost shrieks out at you that this is the most densest and the most you know concentrated uh, bunch of numbers. This one is an exception because it stands out directly. And here are some holes which you know maybe like if this was a real data, this means like something is off. Essentially, humans are vision machines. Uh, most of your brain is dedicated to processing the vision input. That is how we naturally evolve to use our eyes and consume information to see patterns. We have been visualizing data since time immemorial. What do you see? You see clouds. Do you see something? Do you see faces? Do you see? Even when like we are not supposed to see patterns, you know, humans are great at identifying patterns. And this is something I learned from my architecture college which you know I was frowning upon which I now got to apply after coming back to MIT I realized that like, I had the ability to tell stories in a visual way in a way that people understand and that led me to doing projects which in which I leveraged the fact that people are visual creatures you know one such uh, visualization which happened in the wild is visualizing how do people consume wheat and rice rice in India and what percentage of population is vegetarian. And here you see automatically when you visualize data like this, things which would not be clear in a table, in a tabular format, instantly shout at you saying like there might be some correlation over here. And people don't just discuss and identify it, but they add their own insights. For example, some of you said, does wheat have more protein than rice? Is that the reason non-vegetarianism is prevalent in rice in this places to compensate for protein? And you know, insights like this wouldn't have arised if like all people saw was like a bunch of numbers. It is when you bring that to a visual way that it gets clearer for people. And uh, visualizing a lot of these maps and patterns, I have realized that there is an interesting line that happens which divides India into a north, west and a south, east uh, cultures. In some ways, this is the line where the bread eating culture of the Middle East interacts interacts with the rice eating culture of Southeast Asia and a lot of interesting cultural differences come uh, about about this line. For example, who was the most Googled person in 2019? The ones to the northwest of India Googled uh, Nupur Sharma and the rest west there between Rishi Sunak and Draupadi Murmur. Over here you see like the ones in the northwest have really huge families and the ones in the southeast have like pretty tiny families. And then it translates to how many saris do people buy. The ones in southeast of India have lots of saris, but ones in the northwest do not. And that also translates to how the how states have laws for cattle slaughter in different areas. And such things wouldn't be possible if you did not have a quick way of looking at them visually. Sometimes patterns reveal very interesting thought processes in us. Like when you compare like where do people use bikes versus where do people use cars and that makes you think is this related to geography, is this related to economy or is this related to the socio-political uh, economies or what exactly a car represents socially to me, you know, things like that. I don't think the answers are what are interesting, important here. It is these questions that arise and start conversations which I think was the beauty of data visualization. 
The second reason why I think visualizations are interesting is because we as humans are not calculators. We are not designed to store numbers. We don't keep numbers in our mind. We keep insights in our mind. We process information by feelings and not by numbers. And when we have to communicate a lot of numbers, what is essential is if we have some proxies and comparable quantities. For example, instead of saying that India had vaccinated like a billion people, a billion is a term that you know, we don't come across very frequently. Here I have visualized the number of Australia's equivalent of people that India has visualized. So when, how many Australia's and when did uh, India vaccinate? And this, for example, is a visualization of how much carbon dioxide has each continent released into the world versus what is the population that uh, they have had. So when you look at these numbers, the, it is not very clear, but when you represent it in a visual way like this, in terms of a metaphor, you see like these tiny trees of Europe and US, which don't have like that many people, have essentially consumed like tons and tons of carbon dioxide since 1750, while the larger ones have just like barely scratched the surface. And sometimes numbers are not even, you know, designed to sort of inform you. Sometimes they can make a point uh, in a slightly off way. For example, how long does it take for you to afford an iPhone X? You know, there, uh, you could very well just make a bar chart and compare them as like, you know, how much income do each of these people have? But when you present it in a, this almost like a satirical ad sort of way, it hits you in a little different way. So while Jeff Bezos can afford an iPhone in 760 milliseconds, an IIT professor requires 10 days. The 216 million rural people of India would require 7 years to afford the same device. And also sometimes visualization helps you capture things like corruption monies, something is so high that you can't even visualize it. For example, if you have to compare the stacks of corruption money uh, to the Himalayas, if you stack 2,000 rupees one by one, how many Himalayas would that cover? So this is Vijayamalaya, half of the Himalayas, and here this gentleman with like three Himalayas and a half. Uh, how many of you have seen this meme of like what is equality versus equity? So uh, one form of visualization is not even like numbers, but where you play off of memes because this is something that people are familiar with. So in this project, I use this template to sort of communicate uh, per capita income differences. The way I did it was like consider the top 1%, the next 10% and then the rest of the world as three people. And how would they look like if this fence is the world average, where would they exactly stand? So in China, the top 1% has access to the whole stadium, the top 10% has some access and the bottom 50% does not have any access. In South Africa, it's kind of a similar thing, but the bottom 50% is underground. They don't even have access to look at the fence. Playing out the same thing, in US, the top 1% is so high, each of these boxes just piles up and they are off through the fairing. While in Switzerland, you see all of them have access to the stadium in one go. I'm sure all of you are wondering about India. In India, we see uh, the top 1% get access above the world average, but like the bottom 50% are, are under the ground, but you barely see the head up there. But in countries like South Sudan, all of them are under the ground. So it's a play, what could be like a normal uh, bar chart, you know, you could have like these playful ways of telling the same story. So what I learned is that data appeals to the brain, but stories appeal to the heart. And when you combine these two approaches, do you engage all the faculties of people and connect them with your stories? Case in point, here are two uh, maps. One is how many pounds do people consume in each state? And over here is how many Olympic sized swimming pools would pan saliva from each state fill in a year. I think one of them is little more yucky than other and it clearly makes a point. This infographic for example was shared by Beautiful Bangalore and then the Cancer Awareness uh, Society and they used it in their official release posters. A similar take is 
what are the consequences of eating gutka by the promoters of gutka, which is both a social parody but also an infotainment poster about what happens if you eat a lot of tobacco. And sometimes visualization can also help you tell stories which would be little dark if you presented it in a non-abstract way. For example, how many people end up taking their lives in India each year for whatever reasons. And you know, these would be really gruesome if you expressed it in a you know, very direct, in a visual, in a cold-hearted manner. And sometimes I think these abstractions helps just make these news a little more palatable. Sometimes data does not even look like data. These are not even numbers, but they are essentially data with ample amount and opportunity to tell stories from. For example, this is a song, Kun Faya Kun, broken down and visualized in terms of which singer sang which section and what instruments were used and what uh, and, and what language was used in each section. This helps you appreciate a song in a different perspective. This is Ek Ladki Ko Dekha To Kaisa Laga in terms of infographics with different elements of uh, that the Ladki evokes represented over here. So, I think towards my end, I'll say based on my experience, a good story always attracts listeners because you know listening to stories is something unique, uh, is something embedded and intrinsic to all human beings. Um, here I have created some economic you know, data because economics is like my least uh, interesting subject. So I have created infographics to understand the subject matter. And you know, that infographic was shared by the CEO of, 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 of Sensex, Ashish Chauhan. Of, uh, and that sort of like made me, you know, inspired that these are stories which I'm not just doing for fun, but like these have impact in the world, that people are interested uh, to listen to these things. Uh, after making these maps for over two to three years, I have distilled it all down combining my software engineering skills and created this website called IIP Maps where anyone can create uh, infographics and maps through public data. All you do is you select, uh, you enter the data over here, you select which palette do you want and uh, you can export it. It's a distillation of everything that I've learned as a data with um, artist all these years. And uh, oh, there's a bunch of templates that you can select from. And all of these maps are created by the people, by the community. And at this moment, I honestly don't even create these maps engagingly. It's a community which is actively dedicated into creating lots of interesting s stuff, which I basically just support and I, I enjoy seeing the revolution that is taking place. So I would just like to, in concluding thoughts, I would say that all great movements, cultural movements and phenomena, were once just an idea, were just were once just a story. And once you tell that story to the world, you know, people would listen and would connect and that story would sort of take from a spark, it would go to a flame and to a wildfire. Thank you.